If you clicked on this video because you're trying to get started on a project using a clear core controller with a 4D systems HMI, you've come to the right place. If you want a full feature development environment with a real IDE and in circuit debugging, I'll show you how to do that too. And if you're following my surface grinder automation build, this is part 11. I think it's part 11. I'll look down in the comments. Someone will tell us if it's part 11, especially if it isn't part 11. If you've been following my Surface Grinder automation project, then you'll remember I made this desktop stand for the HMI and the rest of the control panel so that I can easily bring it in here and put it on my desk next to my computer for programming. And at the last minute, I made this base to hold the clear core board, the encoder input, and all of the connectors and the wiring, again, just to make it easy to move this around from the grinder for testing and in here to my development workstation, just to make everything easier and to not have to deal with all the cables. Now, if you're not familiar with what I've got here, I'll go over it briefly. So this is just a basic control panel. I've got a 4D Systems 7-inch HMI here. We'll talk about that in a little bit. I've got some mechanical controls and an MPG encoder for jogging the machine. The MPG encoder is just wired up through this encoder adapter to the clear core and then the rest of the mechanical inputs are just wired to the digital and analog inputs and then the HMI is connected with a serial port and there's some extra wires to provide extra power but we'll go over that in a little bit and then we'll go over some of the more advanced features like the actual Atmel ICE debugging probe for debugging the controller in circuit and a logic analyzer for debugging the serial communication to the HMI. And then powering this whole thing is just a little benchtop power supply outputting 24 volts. It's, you know, 350 milliamps. It's not much for this setup, but it's enough that I have a nice little environment here that I can use as a workbench for the software development. So I'm not running back and forth or having to use a laptop next to the machine. If you're not familiar with the clear core, it's an industrial motion controller made by Technic. Those are the same people that make clear path motors. And in fact, this interface is directly with their clear path motors, which is the reason why I wanted to use this controller for this project. You can think of this as a motion controller. You can think of this as a PLC. You can think of this as a big fancy Arduino. And unlike an Arduino, which we absolutely could have used for this project, at least one of the faster 32 bit ones, it doesn't have logic level like 3.3 volt or 5 volt IO. It has all 24 volt industrial IO. So it has ports on here that are specifically designed to interface with the clear path motors, but the other IO points or the GPIOs as you would have on an Arduino are all 24 volts. And some of these can are input and output. Some of them are input only. Some of them support analog. Some of them support pulse width modulation. Some of them can output enough power to drive a speaker or small motors in addition to the outputs for the clear path servos. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff on here. It does support ethernet. It has the USB host and programming port, which you use for programming it. It's got two external communication ports, and these can be, uh, these are RJ45 ports, and you can use these for, for SPI, you can use these for RS-232, you can use them for uh, logic level UARTs. It does have a combined IO header, so you can hook up a ribbon cable here on the end to take a bunch of these, if not all of the inputs and outputs off to another board. And then it's also got some other things like a micro SD card slot. And internally, if you take the cover off, it has a space to put an XB radio. The whole thing runs on a single 24 volt power supply and it provides 24 volt output and 24 volt input on all of these GPIO points. So every one of these has got a plus 24, a ground and a signal line. So these are easy to wire up to industrial sensors like proximity sensors or limit switches. And they all have significant protection built in, over voltage, over current. So if you try to use an Arduino in a project like this, you're going to spend a lot of time and effort on interface circuitry and protection and slash or you're going to fry a few of them before you're done. This is intended to be a robust microcontroller that you can run in an abusive industrial environment. They also sell a number of accessories for this, and one that I picked up is their encoder input adapter. 
and this just hooks up to that ribbon cable interface and provides a nine pin connector for a typical five volt encoder. And that's what I'm using for the MPG input on the project. The ClearCore also supports in-circuit debugging and Technic resells the Atmel ICE debugging probe and the appropriate cable to connect it to the ClearCore. You have to take the cover off to connect this. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but this does allow you to do real in-circuit debugging, which is something that at least traditionally is much harder to do with an Arduino. There are a few different options for programming the ClearCore controller. The two that they offer are the Arduino environment, and they actually provide an Arduino wrapper that you can download and install. And they also support the Microchip Studio, which used to be called Atmel Studio, which is a more full-featured IDE for programming in this environment that supports things like debugging. But by far, the simplest way to get started is with the Arduino environment. So you need to download and install the Arduino IDE, and then they have an Arduino wrapper that you install. Now this isn't just a board library. This is something much more, uh, more functional than that. It's got a whole bunch of code that runs inside the clear core to control things. So it's a lot more than just the typical sort of board pin mappings that you would have in the Arduino environment. So it comes as a separate installer that you have to download, unpack and run, and it will find your Arduino IDE and install all of the libraries and the support for the clear core boards into the Arduino IDE. And then once you have that installed, you can just select your Technic clear core. In this case, it automatically found it on COM6. It's connected via USB. I've got my code in here and we can just run this just like anything else in the Arduino environment. We can compile the sketch and we can click the button to upload. Then that just uploads over USB and you get a little light show with lots of blinky lights, including these cool blue underglow lights and it programs and runs. Again, just like with any other Arduino environment. And like I said, there's a lot more going on here than just the typical Arduino pin mappings. There is background code, timer interrupts, and other hardware interrupts running that are managing all of the features of the motion controller. So there's a complete path planning system. You tell the motor using their library to move to a certain position at a certain speed with certain accelerations, and it will just take care of that in the background. Your code can wait for it to complete or it can check up on its progress while it's doing other things. It's also doing things like debouncing and time filtering analog and digital inputs. It's keeping track of the encoder position using interrupts. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on. Even all of these LEDs that show the inputs are not driven electrically from the inputs. Those are under software control and that background processing is handling that as well. And they even have an e-stop system where for a given motor, you can designate one of the inputs as an e-stop and it will automatically stop the motor according to the deceleration, the emergency deceleration parameters. And so there's, there's just a ton of stuff like that going on and it's all happening in the background so you don't have to worry about it. And you can see these blue LEDs, they're probably strobing on the camera, but there are LEDs on the bottom of the board that kind of emit a blue glow and they sort of breathe to let you know that's happening properly. And if things go wrong, they'll flash out a, a trouble code that you can look up in the manual and figure out what's wrong. And all that functionality is supported in the very simple Arduino software development environment. And that is the major benefit of using the Arduino IDE is that simplicity. You just load the code and go and anybody can do it. The downside, of course, is that the functionality of the IDE is very limited in terms of things that traditional IDEs can do. Um, it does have autocomplete now. That's a relatively recent addition. When I started with Arduino, they didn't have that. And you can like jump to the definitions of things. But in general, it doesn't have all the refactoring and other advanced features of a more powerful IDE. And most notably, it does not support in-circuit debugging. Super easy to get started, but fairly limited if you come from a software development background and you're used to all those features. The other option that Technic offers for programming the clear core is Microchip Studio. And they have a version of their motion library that you can download for Microchip Studio. And they have a document showing you how to set it up. 
Uh, I ultimately just went and downloaded it directly from Microchip. This used to be called Atmel Studio, so if you see that name, you can use those interchangeably. I got the latest version. I downloaded their Motion library and brought it into my solution and got it up and running. And this is what I've shown in previous Surface Grinder videos when I had the clear core motors running. Now the advantage of Microchip Studio is it is a full featured software development environment. So every feature that you're used to in things like Visual Studio or, or uh, Eclipse, those are all gonna be available here. Um, the downside is it's quite a bit more complex and it has a much higher learning curve. And so for an open source project, which is what this is that I'm working on, it means that anybody who wants to work on it is gonna to have to go through the process of downloading and setting this up. And as I found with my electronic lead screw and the TI Code Composer Studio, that's a pretty big hurdle for a lot of people. It makes it a lot more complicated than just using something like Arduino. Now the, on the plus side, this does support in-circuit debugging. So I can plug in my debugging probe, I can come here and I can just set breakpoints in the code and as the microcontroller is running, when it hits those breakpoints, it'll stop and I can look at variables. Debugging's not all it's cracked up to be on an embedded environment like this because a lot of the background stuff like the motion planning and input monitoring and running the LEDs on the clear core, all that stuff is happening in interrupts or timers. So when you're stopped at a breakpoint, all of that stuff stops. So there are some weird things that happen and you have to be judicious about how you use the debugging, but it's better than outputting values to a USB serial port when you're trying to figure out what's going wrong deep in your code. Now the other downside of using Microchip Studio for development is that it does not have all of the Arduino pin mappings and the simplified Arduino programming interface. The version of the motion library that goes into the Arduino IDE does support that. So you can do your typical digital read, digital write, uh, you can use the serial objects just like you would on any other Arduino but in here you can't. And so if you need to use libraries in the clear core that are made for the Arduino environment, like spoiler alert, the 4D systems uh, HMI library for their VisiGenie system, it doesn't work. And so I tried to go down this road. It was super frustrating. I gave up. It turns out there is a much better option. There's a company in England that makes a plugin for Visual Studio for developing Arduino projects. It's called Visual Micro, and this is commercial software, but it's a plugin that goes into the free version of Visual Studio Community and allows you to develop your Arduino projects from within a, a real IDE. Now, it is commercial software, but it's not very expensive. For student and hobby licenses, it's $19 a year, or you can pay more for a perpetual license. If you're using it for commercial purposes, it starts from $75 a year or a perpetual license for $250 for one machine. And for commercial purposes, that is dirt cheap. And for hobbyists, $20 to get started is actually a really good price. So I don't think this is super prohibitive. I decided to try it because I really want a full feature development environment. And the fact that this remains compatible with Arduino is really attractive. So I've got Visual Studio 2022 Community Edition installed here. And this is just a free download from Microsoft. And then I've installed the Visual Micro environment into it and loaded my Arduino project. And I literally just had to go over here and open the same INO or ENO file and all of my code is in here. Of course, I have a fully functional IDE, so I've got multiple windows. I can look at multiple files at the same time. I've got all of the other kinds of plugins you can get. I've full, got, got full GitHub integration. I can get GitHub Copilot integration and all of the refactoring that you would expect from a full featured IDE and it supports in circuit debugging. So this does depend on the Arduino IDE being installed. So it's using those tools. In this case, I have Arduino 2 installed and it also depends on Microchip Studio being installed and if you wanna do the in circuit debugging so that you'll have the Atmel ICE debug probe drivers. If you're not doing debugging, you don't need that. But this doesn't replace Arduino. This is just a different IDE on top of the Arduino system. So you manage your board definitions and your libraries in the Arduino IDE, and then you can do your programming here. So in this case, I've selected my Arduino 2 environment. I've selected the Technic ClearCore board. It has automatically found the board here on COM6. 
I've got my code loaded, I can just hit the button and program. And this works exactly like the Arduino IDE. You see the lights all flash exactly the same. And in fact, you'll see the same output from the, uh, from the programmer as you would see, because it actually is using the Arduino tools behind the scenes. And the really beautiful thing about this environment is that I did not have to modify the code at all to work in Visual Studio. It's still the same Eno file. I've got other files in here. I've got my HMI constants that we'll talk about in a little bit for programming the 4D Systems HMI. I've got the 4D Systems Arduino library just installed into the with the library manager into my Arduino environment, and it shows up here in Visual Studio. And I can move back and forth. I can just close this, open Arduino, and program it. I can check this code into GitHub, which I have, and anybody that wants to use it can load this in the Arduino environment and use it there. They can even modify it there and save it, and it'll work back in this environment. So it really is the best of both worlds for open source because anybody has access to this with a very low, uh, low effort, uh, low learning curve. But then anybody that wants it can also pay 19 bucks and get a much more fully capable development environment. Now, full disclosure, I reached out to Visual Micro and asked them if they would like to support this project, and they sent me a couple of licenses. Got to say, after using it for a little bit, I would have paid for them if they didn't do that, but uh, it's up to you if you want to use this. If you like the Arduino IDE, feel free. If you want something better, it really is pretty cheap. For this project, I decided to use an HMI from 4D Systems in Australia. If you're not familiar with that term, HMI stands for Human Machine Interface, and it's basically an LCD screen with some additional smarts and some designer software. So you're not starting from scratch developing your UI. They have tools to make it a lot easier. Now, when you come out here and try to find the LCD you want to buy or the HMI you want to buy, there are lots and lots of options. Now, I came to 4D Systems particularly because they integrate easily with the Clear Core and they're recommended by Technic. But once you get here, like I said, there are tons of options. They have all different processor types. They have different features. They have some that are for Arduino, some for Raspberry Pi, some they call their micro LCD series with Diablo or Picasso processors or Goldilocks or Pixie processors or Pixie 44. It's quite confusing. I spent a lot of time studying this and I settled on the Gen 4 ULCD series with the Diablo 16 processor. Now, even once you decide on that, there are lots and lots and lots of different options. The one that I got is the 70DT. So this is a seven inch resistive touch screen. They also have capacitive touch. They have standard or wide viewing angles. They have uh, extra bright. They have sealed ones and ones that mount behind a panel. This is the one that I ultimately ended up getting to try. You can swap these out because they're compatible on the software side, but I had to start somewhere. That's the one that I picked. So if you look at my previous videos, you can see how I mounted this and it's just got four tabs. It's got a touch screen, in this case, seven inches, 800 by 480. And then on the back, it has a controller board with the graphics processor. Now this isn't really intended to run your application on it though in some cases that is possible. This is intended to hold the elements for the display and all the functionality for the user interface, and then it communicates via serial port with your microcontroller, in this case, the clear core. Now, one mistake that I made is I did not think I needed a micro SD card. There's a micro SD socket on the back of the, uh, on the back of the board, on the back of the display. And from everything that I could see in the manual, that was optional, but, when I actually tried to start programming things, I found out that at least for what I was trying to do, it really isn't optional. Uh, you need at least a four gigabyte card. Bigger ones are fine. They recommend using an actual industrial card and it does have to support SPI. All the cards I tried did, but I ended up buying an eight gigabyte industrial card to put in here. A couple of things to note. This is not a slide in SD card slot. You can't slide it in. You slide this over and the latch opens, you set the card in, then you close it and slide to latch. That tripped me up and looking around in the forums, that's tripped up a few other people as well. The other thing to know is you do have to format the card using their tools. It's FAT16 with some very specific requirements, but if you use the uh, their, their actual designer tool to do the formatting, uh, then everything will go smoothly.
to actually connect this to the clear core, the display has a 70 pin, or excuse me, a 30 pin flat flex connector. And you'll either need your own hardware or you'll need to use one of their adapters. And they provide an adapter for $25, this design specifically for the clear core. So this has the same 30 pin flat flex. You can connect it directly to the display. On the other side, it has an RJ45 to connect to the serial ports on the clear core. If you're using a small display, that's all you need. But if you're using a larger display like I am with a seven inch or a high brightness display, you'll need to provide power on the input here. It has a really wide input voltage range. It's got a DC to DC converter on the board. Um, I just ran the 24 volts that I was using for the clear core in and that powers the display just fine. This also has a USB port on it that you can use for programming and all this is is just a serial port. You plug this in and it connects you up to the same serial lines that are coming from the clear core and going to the display so that you can program it remotely with their workshop software. You do need to know that when you plug in that USB port to program it, you have to disconnect the serial port that goes to the clear core or the two will interfere with each other. So you have to unplug it from the clear core, program it, then unplug the USB, plug it back into the clear core to run it. There are a couple of other gotchas to know about on the board. There is a little configuration jumper here to select whether you want the power from the serial port or whether you want the power from the auxiliary input. I had to switch this to get the power from the auxiliary input. Before I did that, it just was flashing a white screen because it was powering up and then the overcurrent protection in the clear core was shutting it down. There's also a tiny switch here. And if you go look in the manual, it explains this. This is to enable or disable using the RTS line in the serial port to reset the display. You definitely want that on then from the clear core, you can toggle the RTS line to reset the display and know that you're starting from a clean point to get the serial to synchronize. I didn't do that at first and ultimately discovered I really wanted that. The one other thing about this board that's really handy is that it does have a five pin connector here that is connected to those same five volt serial lines. I'm not using it. It is used for some of their other displays that don't have a flat flex connector. So I don't need it in my application, but because it's there, it's a really handy place to hook up a logic analyzer if you want to debug the serial communication between the clear core and the display. To actually program the HMI, 4D Systems provides something they call Workshop 4. And when you come in here to create a new project, you're immediately faced with a whole bunch of options. So first you have to decide on which display you're using. I'm using the Diablo Gen 4 and here's the 70DT. That's the one that I'm using. Click next. And then the next thing you have to choose is your environment. And this is the first thing that stumped me. I could read all these things, but I didn't know what they meant or what I wanted. So basically designer is a code based environment. You're using something called 4D GL code. You're writing that code and then it compiles it and puts it in the display and then you can run it and see what you've created. But that is a coding type environment rather than a visual type environment. The Visi environment is visual in that you can drag and drop components and design your display. And then it generates the 4D GL code, which you can then edit but it gives you a way to design the component layout visually. But you have to actually write the code to do something behind that. The Visi Genie environment is the one that I ended up using and the one that I recommend, and this is a codeless environment. You don't have, you don't have to code any 4D GL. Now you can buy a pro license for the software so you can put in custom 4D GL, but you don't have to. You can just design your UI, the UI hooks up to a standard set of events that go over serial to report when you press buttons or to set values, and you don't have to write any code. And then they have a library for Arduino that runs on the clear core on the other end or on whatever microcontroller you're using to communicate back and forth. So you visually design the GUI and then messages go back and forth just to populate it with values and respond to events. And then the last environment they have here is serial. And in the serial environment, the display gets a pre-canned set of firmware that basically just makes it a display. So all of the graphics primitives, all of the rendering, everything is happening on the microcontroller and you're just using this thing as a serial connected display and there isn't really anything smart happening in the HMI. So the Visi Genie is the environment that I used. 
And once you go in here, this just gives you, you start out with a form and you can grab components and put them on the form. So if I want a push button, I can select push button and I can put that on my form and I can control this. I have properties to control the colors and the functionality and there are different kinds of buttons with sliders and there are displays and there are graphs and gauges and uh, you know all kinds of things that you can put on this display and hook up. And in general, the way that works is you have properties over here to define the, what it looks like visually, and then you have events. So like on a button over here, if I select this switch and look at events, there's an on changed event, and I can just set that to report message. I can also set it to control other things that are happening on the display, but in my case, I just set it to report message. So now when the user clicks that button, it'll send a serial message back to the clear core that I can then read and my code can respond to. So if I load my code here for the Surface Grinder project, I just have a basic form set up that I can use for my initial development, just trying to get this thing running end to end. So I've got three DROs, I've got three labels, I've got three zero buttons, and then I've got some little indicators that I can light up next to the digits to show what resolution I have set on the MPG and which axis is active. And then I have a little toggle button down here to toggle between inches and millimeters. And each one of these is set up with the properties over here. So I've got the color and the size and the position all set. And then I have events like on the button here, I have this event just sent set to report message. Now I actually do have two forms that I've created. So I've got form one, which is a splash screen, which is the first thing that will go up. And then I have form zero, which I'll switch to once the system initializes that shows this DRO. In a real system, there'll be a lot more. And then all of these buttons have a type and a number. So this is a, called a win button, and this is win button zero. And this is win button one, and this is win button two. And like this LED is ILED one. And this one over here is ILED five. And unfortunately, the way the development environment works, you have to know those numbers and you don't have a good way to control them unless you want to go edit the text files. But those numbers are what are used in the protocol that goes across to the microcontroller. So you're going to have to say, I want to respond to button number three, or I want to light up LED number four. So you need to know those magic numbers and those need to be coded into your project. It's kind of old school, but it allows for very efficient serial communication and makes it so that you don't need a high bandwidth communication channel or a big processor to make this work. So let me power up the HMI here and plug it in via USB. So I have it, I have the serial port disconnected from the clear core so that this will work. And we can come in here and look at comms and you can see that it has already found it. This is on COM5 and it's identified the model. And then over on the project tab, I have a bunch of options. So I have this set up to run from flash. You can also run from RAM or from the micro SD card. Um, because the Diablo 16 processor has multiple banks, you can choose the bank. I'm just doing super basic here. Run from flash, bank zero. You tell it which form you want to come up. You tell it what communication speed. There's like a couple of ports on the HMI. COM zero is the one that connects up through the adapter. And I have the speed set to 115.2 kilobaud. And then there's some other things here. There's some options like whether you want to allow negative LED and custom digit values and leading blanks. You can say what kind of file system you're using. In this case, I'm using FAT. That's on the micro SD card. And then over here, you can change the orientation of the display. In this case, I have it landscape, but you can also flip it. So once you've got that all set up the way you want it, you can come over here to the tools tab. This is where you have your tools with things like um, the tools to format the, the SD card before you start. And then there's some other stuff for programming and there's a debugger that'll allow you to connect to the display and actually activate it remotely. But on the home tab, the button you want is the build copy load. So if I just click this, it will create all the files, compile all of this, and then I'm gonna do a file transfer copy. You can also take the micro SD card out and program that, but if you just hit the file transfer copy, it'll transfer the data to the micro SD card over the serial port. And that'll run in program. And if you watch the display, you'll see it flicker. You'll see some loading messages while it loads the stuff into flash. 
and then it'll boot and go to form one, which is what I had configured as the first form. Now this is ready to start writing the code in the clear core to talk to the display and the user interface that I've defined. To actually talk to the HMI from the clear core, we need the proper library. So if I come in here to library manager and, and just search for Genie, um, there are two libraries in here from 4D systems. There's Genie Arduino and there's Genie Arduino Dev. Genie Arduino Dev is the new library that they recommend using. They consider it stable now. Um, it's a couple years old, but the Genie Arduino is the old one for backwards compatibility. So I installed the Genie Arduino Dev here in the Arduino IDE, and then that makes it available in the Visual Studio environment where I'm actually doing my work. So I can just include Genie Arduino Dev, and then I get that code so that I can use it to talk to the, uh, to the HMI. Now, because you have to talk to the display just using the numbers of things, like if I want to get something from this button, that's win button one, I have to know that magic number. I have to know that one. So I have uh, something called HMI constants, which is a header file that I created. And so here it is, HMI DRO zero button Y is defined as one. That gives me a nice name that I can use in my code. Now, there's a bunch of code in here for a bunch of things, but ultimately to connect this up, what we have to do is set up a serial port at the correct baud rate. Here's 115.2 kilobaud. Now this says HMI, but what that is, is I've actually come up here and taken uh, HMI and defined that to be serial one so that I have a nice handle to, to use on that and I don't have to just remember that it's serial one or serial zero and I have a place to change that. So the relevant code here is HMI begin or serial begin on the serial port, set it to the right baud rate, and then we call genie begin with that serial port. And we keep looping until it returns true. Now there is another line that's shown in some of their sample code where you wait until genie.isOnline returns true. I don't think that's actually necessary uh, when you're first starting up. There might be some other reasons why you would want to do that. Then you can attach your event handler, and we'll look at my event handler function here in a minute. And then you can just start executing genie commands to talk to the display. So in this case, genie set form, HMI form DRO, and that is form zero. So this is going to come up with form one. As soon as this command executes, it's going to uh, set it to the DRO form. Right contrast sets the contrast. And then I've got, I'm turning the red LED on the clear core off so that I know that the initialization is done. And then we go into our loop. And as you go around the loop, you have to call this genie.doEvents all the time. So if you're doing anything that's time consuming and preventing this loop from going around, you need to call that and call it often. And what that's doing is reading from the serial port. So any events coming back from the HMI, it's reading those, interpreting them, and then calling your event handler. And so the event handler gets called when a message has been received from the HMI, you DQ the event frame, and then you look at it. So in this case, I've got some code that says if the event is a report event for the, uh, uh, and, and it's for a button, and it's specifically for DRO button X, then I do something that's the, that's the zero button for X. If the report I get is a report event for a win button, and it's win button Y, which is number one, then I know that that's a zero for the Y DRO. Um, and this is how you have to code this. These messages are going to come in and you've got to respond to them with these, uh, with these switches. Now you could set this up as a tree of if statements. You could set this up with uh, switch statements with cases. In this case, they have this event is function that makes it super easy. Genie, if genie.event is this event, the type, the type of object and the identifier. And then you can uh, actually look at the data in the event if it's a, an event that has data and you can respond to it. So to write to my DROs, I know that those are LED digits. So I'm calling the write int LED digits and I'm passing the identifier of which LED digits widget on the screen I want to update and the value that I want to update it to. And the same thing is true with the LEDs. I'm calling genie write object. I'm saying that what I want to write is an ILED. And here is the identifier of the LED 
and then I calculate the value that I want to put in there. So all of this development is done this way where you're saying, hey, I want to write it's an object of this type and it's an object uh, with this number. It's kind of archaic by modern standards, but it's a very efficient protocol, and so that's how this works. So the end result, if we actually look over here at the HMI, I'll just go ahead and reset the clear course so you can see it's starting up. It's going to start up, it's going to show the splash screen, and then after we're done initializing, it'll issue the command to switch to form zero, and now we have our HMI. So normally this isn't responding to the MPG input. If I switch to X, you can see it's lit up the uh, light next to the X axis DRO, and that was just a serial message that was sent over to the display to do that. And then based on the resolution that I select, it's sending messages to light up the LED above the appropriate digit. And then when I turn the HMI, it increments or decrements the value. I can change the resolution. I can change which axis I'm moving. Now, of course, there's nothing here connected to any of the motors yet. This is all just a demo end to end to make sure that I could get everything working with my controls, with the microcontroller and with the HMI. And then of course I can zero all of these. So if I were actually running the grinder and I wanted to lower the head, um, I could set this to Y. I've got it zeroed at my position and I can lower it in fractions. So I can bring it down, there's one tenth. There's another half a tenth. And I can operate the grinder this way. Of course, none of that's coded. Well, actually, I believe that the microcontroller is trying to run the motors of the x-axis back and forth because that code's still in the loop, but I haven't coded this up to work with the DROs yet. To debug in circuit, we need a couple of things. We need the Atmel ICE debug probe, and we actually have to plug it into the USB port, ask me how I know. And then we have to have that connected to the clear core. And there's just some little pogo pins and some little holes in the board here, and it's really fiddly, but I've already got it snapped in and I had to take the cover off in order to make that work. Now the original cover is made out of this clear polycarbonate and it's got these nice little light pipes to bring all the LEDs up to the surface. But I went ahead and made my own because I would like to have a cover on here with that attached. So mine has uh, an opening for that. I just downloaded the model of the clear core from the Technic website isolated this in Visual Studio, separated out the parts so that I could use Clear Pet G to print the light pipes, and then just printed this on the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon as a multi-material model with black Pet G high flow and clear Pet G. I think it was Overture brand, but it doesn't really matter. And then because I could, I went ahead and lasered some markings on the front. So now I have a cover that will fit on here and provide an opening for the debug connector. Now, I don't have it on right now, I'll put it on later. Let's take a look at the actual debugging process. Now to actually debug something using that with it all connected, I'll just come down here in my code and I'll find a place where I want to break in. Here's my code that updates the DROs. I'll just click here to set a breakpoint and then I will hit the start button to program the microcontroller and start the debugger. Now for whatever reason, after you programmed it, it stays in this flashing bootloader, I think, mode and you have to reset the clear core get that signal, I'll just ignore that, and then I'll hit continue on the debugger here, and we should be up and debugging. So now if I do something that actually causes me to enter that part of the code, like if I turn the MPG, then we will stop at that breakpoint, and now I can look at my local variables, I can see my count, I can look at my DRO values, so DROX is zero, DROY is one, and DROZ is zero, and if I hit continue, those then update on the display. So there's lots of things you can do in here. You do have to be a little bit careful because while you're stopped at a breakpoint, like here while I'm running, you can see that that LED is flashing when I press the run button, but if I stop at a breakpoint, now I'm at a breakpoint, do the same thing, you'll see that LED is not toggling down here on the board until I continue. Now, what the Technic guys tell me is that things like the hardware inputs will continue to work, it's just stuff that's driven by the interrupts that stop. So you just have to be aware of that, and if weird things are happening, that might be your issue. The one other thing that I will say is when you're done debugging and you stop, I have found that sometimes you have to reset the board a couple of times. I've seen cases where you have to unplug and replug the USB. 
to get it to update before you'll be able to program it again. I don't know what that is. It's some kind of state deal, but you reset a couple of times and you're good to go. When I first started trying to get this stuff working, I was having a terrible time getting the display to initialize reliably. I had some situations where it was responding really slowly. I had some situations where it would not respond at all for a while. And so I pulled out a logic analyzer to debug this. And as I pointed out earlier on the adapter board, there's those handy little pins and you can just plug in a logic analyzer. So that's exactly what I've done here. I've got my little Salier uh, Logic Pro 16 back here plugged into those lines and I have a project in Logic 2 configured. So I've got three ports. One of them is connector three inputs. One's connected to the RTS line that's used for the reset. One is set for the transmit and one is set on the receive. And then I have these configured with serial decoders. So the uh, serial parameters are just set in here, 115.2. Uh, eight bits, one stop bit, no parity, and both of those are set up that way. So if I just hit the button, it'll start recording. So now if I dial this around, so messages are going back and forth, hit the stop button, uh, I should then be able to go look at this communication. And so we can just connect in here and I can see here's a 0x01, that's a set value command with the parameters of what type of thing we're setting, what the index is and the value and a checksum. And then I can see this 0x06 response, which is an ACK, an acknowledgement. Then here's another set. And if I look down here a little bit further, after a little bit, we get another acknowledgement, then another set, another acknowledgement. So we can see this communication going back and forth. Let's see if we can catch a button press. Start again here. Press that, stop. Now let's go back and see what we've got. So here's a case where we have an event coming from the HMI. This is a button press. So the 0x07, I believe, is a report. And then that's triggering the code in the clear core that's then immediately doing a set of the display. There's the ACK for that. And this just goes right down the line. And so what I originally hooked this up for is debugging the startup behavior. So I'll hit the, I'll start recording here and I'll reset the clear core. I'll let this go through its startup. And now it's initialized. So if we look at this, you can see the RTS line going low, that's asserted, and then it's deasserted. That causes the HMI to reset. And then we have about five seconds we're waiting before we send the first command. And I didn't show you this code. We'll go take a look at this here. Um, what's happening here is I'm using the connector com one, which is part of the advanced API for the clear core. And we're setting RTS mode to on that's pulling it low, waiting hundred milliseconds and then setting it to off. That's letting it go high. That causes the HMI to reset. And then I'm delaying five seconds before we start talking to it. When I first started out, I wasn't doing that and it ended up being a problem. If you're a patron, you can go over on the discourse groups and I've got a whole thread on this where I was detailing everything that I was dealing with and the whole learning process of figuring out how to bring this thing up. And as I was debugging this, I put up some screenshots here for patrons to see. So go check that out if you're interested. If not, and just watch this and consider it a summary. But this is what this looked like originally when I was starting talking to it before I waited at least mm, about three seconds is what I found is really required. So there's the end of the reset. And then down here are a bunch of commands. I'm starting to talk to it and it's not responding for a while. And then when it finally does start responding, the thing is out of sync because it missed a bunch of messages and it got some partial frames and it starts responding with NACs or negative acknowledgements. So this is kind of what it looks like. Here's a command coming in from the microcontroller and here's a 0x15, that's a NAC, and then there's another NAC, and then there's a response to something that the microcontroller sent earlier. It might be a response to this command, it might be a response to something else. There's no sequence numbers in the protocol, but it was getting out of sync and all kinds of weird things were happening. And then I'd send another command and get another NAC because I started talking to it before it was ready to listen and the protocol does not handle that well at all. So what ended up happening is I, messed around with this and finally figured out that when the display is booting, it's reading code off of the micro SD card. 
maybe there are situations where that doesn't happen, but in my configuration, it certainly does. And we need that five second, uh, that five second time to let everything boot, know it's up and then start talking to it. And that is the reason why I put in a splash screen because the very first command after we wait for it to initialize is to put the other display up and take away the splash screen. So if that doesn't happen, I know instantly that there was some kind of communication problem. None of their samples in their code that they publish shows that delay as being necessary, but if you run into problems like this and you don't want to spend hours debugging it, I would recommend putting in a delay. Well, I've obviously got a lot more work to do to get this project actually running on the grinder, but now that I've got the development environment sorted out, that's the part that's actually fun. I really dread the bring up process on a new development environment. This is new hardware I've never worked with. This is a new debugger that I haven't worked with. It's a new HMI that I haven't worked with. Everything here is new and it has been quite a learning curve. I have spent hours and hours and hours reading documentation, trying things, getting frustrated, trying more things. And hopefully this video is the one that I wish I could have found to help me go through that process a little bit easier. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and maybe check out supporting the channel over on Patreon. And like I said, all of this is being detailed in just excruciating detail on the forums and patrons have access to that. And you can join in the conversation and uh, maybe learn something or maybe I'll learn something from you. Thank you for watching.